Uh, my name is Jeremy Fioravanti. I'm the uh, president of the Delaware County Institute of Science, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for our virtual lecture. This is no small feat because our society was founded in 1833, and our new building, 1867, is uh, undergoing some exterior work as we speak, which is causing me uh, to gobble down antacids like it's candy. Um, basically, exciting things are going on at the Institute. We have an election season coming up. So if you have folks who are experienced with nonprofit management or want to get involved with volunteerism, please um, consider those opportunities. Um, we are back open to the public. Uh, it's not widely uh, distributed right now, but we are open on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You do not need to make a reservation to come. If you want to bring your uh, family members or young folks, and another time, please just send us an email and try to give us about two weeks to make sure that it's properly staffed for your visit. Um, basically, I want to thank Dr. King uh, and Drexel for hosting this webinar tonight and Dr. Gurton with Penn State. Um, and we have a very exciting lecture next month, which I'm sure Dr. King will fill you in on. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Dr. King. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, for an exciting uh, lecture today. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speaker and then I'll um, give a couple pointers about kind of procedure. Um, so start off our speaker today, um, Amy Mommy. She Mommy, she's a garden educator and photographer. She spent over 13 years leading education and visitor experience teams at public gardens. She's currently the education manager at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens and has also worked at Tyler Arboretum and Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. Uh, she holds a um, MS in public horticulture from the University of Delaware and a BS in plant science from Cornell University. Um, the procedure for today, Amy's gonna um, give her lecture in just a moment. Uh, we really encourage you to um, ask some questions. Uh, a couple, we know a couple of you have submitted questions during the registration. Uh, we've let Amy know about those um, in advance and we'll um, give her a chance to answer um, those at the end of the lecture. Uh, during the presentation, however, we also encourage you to submit your questions. You can do that either using um, the Q&A or the chat feature, um, and we'll collect those questions and feed those to Amy uh, once she is done. Uh, so. Uh, Amy, we look forward to your presentation and uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Just give me one second. All right, are we seeing that? Good. All right, awesome. So hi, everybody. Um, as Dr. King mentioned, I am Amy Mobby. I'm the Education Manager at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. And at the end, I'll chat a little bit about Jenkins, but we'll jump right into the main event here. I'm so excited to talk about native spring ephemerals. They're one of my favorite groups of plants. Um, I really fell in love with them when I started working at Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve in New Hope, and that love has just continued over the years. So let's just talk first, what are spring ephemerals? You may not be familiar with that term. Um, spring ephemerals are our native wildflowers that are found in the woodlands that we have in our own backyard and in a lot of our public gardens in the region. So they love rich woodland soil in our eastern deciduous forests. They're really cool adaptations that we'll talk about tonight. So their whole life cycle happens so quickly this time in spring. So they're going to grow, bloom, and set seed in this very quick time period between when the ground is thawing and they're able to um, start pushing up from the ground and before the trees actually pop all their leaves out in the tree canopy. So they're these tiny little plants and what they're doing is they're gonna to try to soak up all of the energy um, from the sun. It's kind of full sun for them right now, right? Because they don't have the tree leaves. Um, they go through their life cycle really quickly before those leaves, um, come out on all of the trees and then they're gonna die back for the rest of the year. So what they do is they do, they die back. Some of them will, I mean, I say die back, it's not like instantaneously. Some of them die back quicker um, than others. Some will keep their leaves around for a little bit longer. And then what they do is they spend the remaining seasons underground as either 
um, rhizomes, corms, bulbs, you call those geophytes. Um, same thing with you're seeing with the daffodils and crocuses right now, they are geophytes as well. They have an underground storage organ. Um, they could also stay underground as seeds for that year. Um, but it's important to know if you are someone who is doing plant inventories or maybe you've new, moved into a new home in the area. Um, you know, you want to look at your garden and what you have, your landscape, multiple seasons, not just one and go out and say, okay, these are all the plants on this property. Because if you did that plant inventory in say fall, you would have no evidence that these spring ephemerals would be on that property. So again, if you're looking to do plant inventories, um, say out in a natural area or your own backyard, you want to do those in multiple seasons so you're able to see if cool plants like spring ephemerals might be out there um, during the, the early to kind of mid-spring pushing into summer. That's some of them hold their leaves a, about that long, like bloodroot, I can picture the leaves um, in some spots staying that long. And it's really interesting to think about growing spring ephemerals. It's really for the long haul. So they can take a long time to flower from seed. Um, so it's kind of a patience, right? Um, so many plants take seven years to bloom from seed. Um, you know, things like trillium and trout lily, it's gonna take a little bit of an investment of time if you're putting a seed in the ground. So that's why a lot of people might shop at places like Jenkins and buy spring ephemerals that have already been, you know, in that pot for a couple years growing, um, maybe even seven years. Um, and they're at the point where they're ready to bloom. Um, just a note and a reminder not to wild collect. So it's tempting when these spring ephemerals come up in our woodlands and you might be out for a hike, you might see um, different flowers in bloom and you know now that it takes a long time for them to get to that point. Uh, you may be tempted to go out and dig something up and put it in your garden, but I'm here to say, please, please, please do not wild collect. Um, these plants also have underground relationships with mycorrhizae and other, you know, kind of fungal relationships. If you move them, um, they're not going to survive. And it's also not a super ethical thing for us to be doing. Um, and it's also a good reminder to also know where your um, plants are coming from if you are buying them from um, someone who's selling, having a plant sale in the spring, you want to make sure it's from a reputable source, again, Jenkins, or um, someone that you can count on, right, to know where those plants came from. So let's talk a little bit about survival adaptation. So these spring ephemerals are really, really small plants. So I kind of joke when we're on tours this, this time of year and we're looking at spring ephemerals, everyone's looking down. I might be crouched on the ground pointing at things. So these are tiny little diminutive plants, but they really have a place in our ecosystem and also in your gardens. So they're gonna grow low to the ground because they're gonna be sheltered from the wind and cold. Um, if anything is evidenced by the last couple of weeks, um, wind, cold, rain, all of that, um, you know, they're trying to come up and take advantage of the light source, but they need to have that adaptation to um, make it through what they might be enduring. They also are going to store food in that underground structure. Remember, I mentioned geophytes. So they have tubers, corms, rhizomes, bulbs. They have that wonderful energy, and that's what's really helping them to burst into growth this time of year. And then they also have an adaptation to go underground and avoid the heat and drought of the summer months, which is important because as we talk about where they grow, they really like a moist soil. They don't want to be in a situation where they're going to get hot and lose moisture in the soil. So they're just going to go dormant for the rest of the year so they don't have to deal with that. Isn't that nice? <laughs> So thinking about pollination for spring ephemerals, okay? So for all of you nature photographers out there, know that your moment to go and photograph spring ephemerals is not going to be on a cloudy day or at night. I'm sure you're not out maybe at night, but maybe a cloudy day, rainy day. Uh, spring ephemerals actually will close up their flowers uh, to protect their pollen and nectar source. Again, they're going through that life cycle super quick they need to be protective of what they have and only open up on a really sunny day because that's when their pollinators are going to be active. 
They have cup-shaped flowers that direct the sunlight onto their reproductive parts. Um, so they have this, you know, again, this wonderful shape. Those sun rays come right into those, those stigmas and styles and get everything moving um, again so they can go through their life cycle quickly. They might be self-pollinated or insect pollinated, which gives them a better chance of producing seeds. So if an insect doesn't visit them in say a couple days, a lot of them are able to actually self-pollinate and create seeds that way. Because it might be a bad weather week for them and they might just have to move on. <laughs> um, they also attract pollinators by um, really cool nectar guides on the petals. I'll show you a picture of one that uses that strategy soon. Uh, bright colored petals or even subtle scents to attract pollinators to the flowers. And seeds are often dispersed by ants. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So I'm not gonna tell you the name of this plant. Kudos out there if you know what it is already. Um, so you can see this is an example of what a flower might do during a cloudy day or a rainy day. They kind of close up again to protect that pollen. Here it is on a sunny day, bright, bright, beautiful day. Um, they open up, have that cup shape. Look at that perfect cup shape. Um, ready to rock and roll. And then you can see, here's my example of nectar guides. So you can see up here, these kind of pink stripes in the petals. That's like the guys or girls at the airport with the, with the light sticks, right? Telling the airplanes where to go. Those little nectar guides are telling the pollinators like, come on in, come right here and get a nectar reward. Um, and while you're doing that, you're going to get my pollen all over you and then hopefully move to the next plant. So this is a cute little spring ephemeral called Spring Beauty. And I'll show it to you a little bit bigger in the next slide. But while we're here, I want to talk about something that's really unique to Spring Beauty. So Spring Beauty is, has a pollen specialist bee. It's a type of Andrina bee. It's a it's called a spring beauty minor bee. Um, so again, the plant's called spring beauty. It's native bee pollinator is a spring beauty minor bee. So we have all these wonderful relationships with insects and plants that have co-evolved together. Um, and it really, again, it's a pollen um, specialist insect. So it's only collecting pollen from just a couple, if not just one plant, um, for that season. So again, it's really important for us to have a diversity of native plants out there and to make sure that these populations survive because there's, again, if we don't have this plant, we don't have that specific bee. And then how does it all, how does it then affect the rest of the ecosystem and the, and the food web? Also draw your attention to the color of the pollen. So spring beauty has pink pollen, um, not a very, um, you know, you might think pollen, you're going to think more yellow or even white, but uh, this plant has pink pollen, which I think is really special. So again, Spring Beauty is the plant we've been talking about here. Claytonia virginica is the scientific name. They actually have underground tubers. We talked about how all these plants are geophytes. Um, this one has an underground tuber that's like a small potato, and Native Americans actually would um, dig them up and eat them. But if we think about that concept, right, if you're digging a plant up and eating them, then you don't have more of that plant. So um, please know that as kind of a cool, fun fact, but uh, please do not go out and dig up our spring beauties. Um, but if you're stuck in the woods, um, you'll know that this one can, can be eaten. All right, our next plant is trout lily. This is Erythronium americanum. It is our earliest blooming native lily. And just look at that flower, oh my goodness. But again, these plants are, you know, maybe four to five to six inches off the ground. So we're talking about tiny little flowers, which are so special in the woodland. But this is often what you'll see. And this is what we see a lot at Jenkins. When we go out, we'll see these speckled leaves popping up from the leaf litter. And what's interesting to know is again, single leaves until it has stored enough energy in that underground structure. And then I'll show you some pictures of what it looks like when it's getting ready to bloom. So you'll be walking around right now and you're gonna see seas of these really cool speckled mottled leaves. And that's where it gets its name trout lily from. 
because it looks like the speckled um, skin of a trout. And you'll just see all these single little leaves popping up and none of these will bloom. Okay, what you wanna look for are ones that have two leaves. So here we have a leaf that's coming towards me and a leaf that has been curled and is protecting that flower as it comes out of the ground. And you'll see that is common for a lot of these plants. Um, so that second leaf is popping up and it will push away. And again, these two leafed moments, probably about four to seven years from seed for trout lily to get to this point where it's stored up enough energy underground to push up and produce a flower that season. So when they do, it's a really special moment and you can get them en masse, um, which we have at Jenkins. It's a really cool thing to see. So again, this flower, if you can picture this flower is going to, it's a nodding flower and every day it's going to open and close and open and close due to that day and night um, adaptation. So it will reflex its petals back. And you can see there's even a little, a little insect visitor on the petals in this picture. And hopefully those insects do visit and pollinate. And you can see that the, um, you know, the re some of them have really reflex petals. And then hopefully again, those insects visited and then we'll get these lovely seed pods that are produced. At this point in the season, you can see that the, the coloration in the leaves have really changed. Um, it's really, you know, as that flower is pollinated, it's signaling to the plant, okay, we're good, we did our thing. Now it's time to start, you know, you can, you can start dying back the leaves. We're gonna go underground for the rest of the, for the rest of the year. Our next plant is Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica. Um, Virginia bluebells is in the borage family. And usually borage family members are really hairy. They have hairy leaves, hairy stems, but that's not the case for Virginia bluebells. And what I will say about their stems is they're very hollow stems. Um, so you do have to be a little bit careful once they are in bloom, um, you know, they can kind of get get knocked over and almost like a straw, right? They can bend kind of easily. So here's what will happen when Mertensia starts to pop out. Um, it has this wonderful spatula shaped leaves with almost a little bit of coloration in the leaves. Um, we noticed that with some of the spring ephemerals. They'll come up and kind of be a little bit purpley. Um, they'll still have some pigmentation in them until they're really photosynthesizing and getting all that green pigment, that chlorophyll moving around. Um, you can see the, the lovely little buds in the center. That's always the exciting moment. So, um, and what's really cool about bluebells is they have these tubular uh, shaped flowers that kind of come out one by one. You don't really notice it when there's a lot of them started, but this picture really shows this is the first one to start, okay? And then from there, all of those closed tight buds will start opening up and have these beautiful trumpet flowers. So when I worked at Bowman's Hill, there's this really cool trail called the Perry Trail. The Perry Trail is kind of a floodplain trail. Bluebells actually do like a little bit more moist soil um, than some of these spring ephemerals can tolerate. And they just pop up wherever they want. They didn't care that um, you know, this was the walkway and they weren't supposed to be there. Uh, they were happy and they would kind of spread nicely from year to year. And the leaves would pop and the buds would start coming up and everyone would start calling Bowman's Hill and saying, are the bluebells ready? Are the bluebells ready? And we'd have to tell people where they were at because this is what it looks like when there's bluebells en masse. It's just a sight, absolutely stunning. And in between all of those bluebells were things that we're gonna talk about tonight. There were trout lily, there were spring beauties, um, trillium, all of these wonderful spring ephemerals, all kind of commingling and living together in this, this woodland area. So um, now it's your turn to call Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve in New Hope and start asking when the bluebells are gonna be blooming. Um, they may already have started, who knows. All right, we're gonna talk about two uh, dicentras here. You guys might be more familiar with uh, bleeding heart as a dicentra, but these are um, two that we're gonna talk about that are spring ephemerals. So on the left, we have Dutchman's breeches, dicentra cupularia, and squirrel corn on the right, dicentra canadensis. So when these plants are coming up, 
kind of hard to tell them apart by their leaves. Um, they have this wonderful kind of grayish green foliage. It's very serrated. It's, um, you know, I think it has a lot of cool texture to it. So as far as a plant goes, um, I think it's interesting from a leaf standpoint as well. But when you really start kind of being able to differentiate it is when it starts putting up its, uh, its flower buds, right? So I'm looking at this one, I'm starting to see kind of spurs on the side, not so much heart shape, but more spurs. And so I'm gonna say that that's Dutchman's breeches. And this is what it looks like, no joke. Um, this is the time of year where I get to use the word pantaloons a lot, which is really fun. Um, so they look like little pantaloons hung up to dry on a clothesline. Um, just absolutely amazing. Um, whoever came up with this design, kudos. <laughs> so what's really cool about uh, both of these Dicentra species is that they are both in the poppy family. So poppy fa family member flowers have four petals. Um, they have two outer petals and two inner petals. And these specifically have two outer petals that are fused together and inflated into the pants. And then there's two petals that are on the inside and they protect the reproductive parts on the inside. And it's really that queen bumblebee who wakes up this time of year and is looking for nectar sources who can come and dislodge those inner petals and get in there um, to get the nectar reward. Some will come and they'll cheat. We call it nectar robbing. So there might be other insects that might come up the stem, come to the flower, chew holes in the pant, in the pantaloons. I have to try to say that out loud as much as possible. <laughs> um, so it'll chew a hole in the pantaloon and it will sneak in and it will steal the nectar that way. Instead of having to be a bumblebee and get it the way that it knows how, um, again, it will come up and rob the nectar from the, the top of the pants. And then this is what it looks like when you have a lot of Dutchman's breeches in one area. I think it just looks like a little magic fairyland. Um, all of those little uh, flowers dancing out there, I think it's just beautiful. So again, when you're thinking about planting at home, um, you know, one plant is, is great, but having threes and fives, you know, groupings of these plants really make an impact. And then we have the heart-shaped spurs, right? So this is squirrel corn. Um, again, the foliage is pretty similar. They bloom a little bit later to what I'm re remembering as far as cycle goes. Um, but again, really seeing that heart shape, I know that that's gonna be squirrel corn. So, um, one other way, which to me is kind of the telltale, is if you move the leaves apart and go down to where the stems attach to, you know, hit the, hit the soil line, you'll find these funny little nodules. Um, they're little uh, nodules on the roots and they look just like little kernels of corn. And uh, that's why it's called squirrel corn because of these cool little nodules on the roots. So if you have trouble trying to figure out this plant and it's not blooming, you can always look down to the soil and see if it has nodules. If it does, it's squirrel corn. If it doesn't, it is Dutchman's breeches. And then again, hopefully those wonderful bumblebees visited um, and they were pollinated and now they'll set seed and then they will die back for the rest of the year. Bloodroot is our next plant. Bloodroot is Sanguinaria canadensis. Um, bloodroot is also in the poppy family. Um, so you're like, okay, you taught me poppy family has four petals. Well, bloodroot has eight. Um, so uh, what they're thinking is when you look at the flower, I think you can kind of see it here. There's almost like two different layers of petals. There's like an outside layer and then an inside. Um, and they think that that second layer of petals actually were derived from the male parts, the stamens, um, and they created more petals maybe to um, try to attract more pollinators. Bloodroot comes up again, this wonderful time of year pushes through that leaf litter. Um, and let me actually take a little divergence for a quick second. So if you've noticed in a lot of my pictures, um, all of which I've taken, I love being out there taking pictures of spring ephemerals. Um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of leaf litter, right? I feel like most of the backdrop of my photos is leaves. Um, that's why we always preach, leave the leaves. These little woodland guys, they are used to living in environments where leaves from trees fall on top of them. Um, 
you know, you don't need to be out there. Like, yes, if it's a deep, thick mat of leaves on top, they're going to have some trouble. Um, you can always consider, you know, shredding up some leaves to make a little bit more leaf mulch. But I mean, these leaves are whole, they're out there. Um, you know, a woodland doesn't have curators and gardeners out there moving the leaves. So the plants will per persevere and they want to. That's the environment that they're used to. It keeps moisture in there, it protects them. Um, and it also brings a lot of other good things, microbes and other microorganisms that will live in the soil as well. So again, leave the leaves. Um, let the plants grow up into this wonderful leaf mulch. Your leaves will break down and make leaf mold and enrich your soil as well. Back to bloodroot. So bloodroot actually has one leaf and you're probably like, okay, well with twin, uh, excuse me, with uh, trout lily, we had one leaf and it didn't bloom. Um, bloodroot just has one leaf and it blooms. That's just the way that this plant works. Um, so it'll have that one leaf that kind of comes and protects the flower as it's coming out from the ground. And then the, the leaf will kind of push off to the side as that wonderful flower gets to shine. So again, a wonderful example of a cup-shaped flower with all those reproductive parts just out in the sun trying to get moving. I feel like bloodroot is one of the most ephemeral of the spring ephemerals. It's there for a couple days. Um, so if you get to see a bloodroot flower, it's kind of a special moment because the next time you'll see it, the petals will be on the ground um, and that, that seed will start to be produced already. Um, blood root does have a blood root. So if you were to be able to see the rhizome, which grows underground, um, inside of that rhizome is a, a red color. It's a red sap. Um, also, if you were to tear the leaves, um, if you have really good eyesight, you may be able to see it here. The vein in that leaf right there kind of has a red tinge. If you were to tear the leaf and kind of squish those veins, a little bit of red um, sap would come out. And Native Americans would actually use this as a body paint or a dye, um, but you do have to be careful. Um, we do believe that I, what I have read is that the sap is caustic. So um, it's not something that I would encourage you all to do, but it's a cool thing to know about bloodroot and where the name of the plant came from. All right, this next one is twin leaf, Jeffersonia diphylla. Um, Jeffersonia, the genus, is named after Thomas Jefferson. Diphylla, we'll come to find out, is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, you'll see the really cool leaf. Uh, it's actually one leaf that's kind of squished and pinched in the center. So it does look like two mirror image leaves, but it's actually just one leaf that got pinched in the center. But look at that flower already. Perfect spring ephemeral textbook, right? Um, cup shape, just ready to rock and roll and get that sun. So twin leaf is actually the logo plant from Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. And when I worked there, someone said, oh, the twin leaf is up, you need to go see it. So I went up to the what was called the medicinal walk. I'm not sure if it's called that any longer, but I went up to that trail and I walked it and I came back and I said, you guys have to help me, I can't find it. Um, this is what I was supposed to look for. All of this craziness popping up through the leaf litter. It is not, I, it did not catch my attention. It's very well blended in. Um, and this is what it looks like. I think they look like aliens popping out of the soil. <laughs> um, these are the flowers, of course, the closed buds, and these are the leaves kind of closed up like little praying hands, everything comes up. Again, this crazy pigmentation to it. And then as it catches that sunlight, it starts to photosynthesize and gets green. Um, but what's cool again to know is where there is good habitat and good environment, these spring ephemerals can grow together. So we have the model leaves of trout lily here in the foreground, um, all commingling and, and growing together. So again, that twin leaf, we're, we're opening up that leaf. We have that wonderful cup-shaped flower just wanting to get that sunlight. Uh, look at all that nice creamy yellow pollen just begging for a bee to come and visit. Um, this one actually doesn't have a nectar reward from what I understand. They are attracting pollinators to come and to hopefully get pollen all over them, but they're actually not having a nectar reward. So it's a little bit of false advertisement here. And then those leaves just keep getting bigger and greener and greener. And then after that flower has been pollinated, um, it produces this almost cookie jar or urn shaped uh, seed pod. 
Um, I love these leaves. I think they look like almost like little elephant ears. <laughs> All right. And one day when I was at Bowman's Hill, I found this seed pod out on the trail and it had started to pop open, which means that it's, you know, ripened and those seeds are going to be popping out. And um, this will come up again later. So I will be the first to, to admit to everyone that I am a, a dissector. I am a learner by doer. <laughs> um, I knew that there was something cool about these seeds and I really wanted to see them. So I helped that little seed pod kind of pop off. Um, and this is what I found, all these lovely seeds stuck together. I do wish this picture of mine was a little bit better in focus, but you can see there's this little thing stuck to the seed. For right now, we're gonna call it the doohickey. And I will talk more about the doohickey in a little bit, but just remember that uh, when, I, when I get a few slides down here. Before we talk about the doohickey, we're gonna talk about trillium. Uh, trillium is just an amazing group of plants. Uh, the genus trillium is represented about, about 49 species worldwide. 39 of those we have in North America. And the greatest concentration of that is in the Eastern US. Now they're not all in the you know, Northeastern US. A lot of them are you know, scattered throughout or down South. Um, but we have so many amazing trillium species that we get to see in our area. And hopefully this is a plant that you have seen before. So trillium meaning tri, three, everything on this plant has three things, right? We have three petals, three sepals, three leaf-like bracts, six stamens, three stigmas, and the, um, you know, the fruit itself, the berry, it's three rib, there's all this three. So Linnaeus did a good job naming this one trillium for all those things that are in parts of threes. So I, I'm going to show you a few specific species tonight, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about trillium ID. Again, there's a lot of trillium to know and to love, and these are things that have helped me along the way to try to figure it out. Um, this photo here is, um, where's my little, there we go. Um, this is actually a photo from Mount Cuba Center. Um, and they have, they had, I'm wondering if it's still in publication, but they had this wonderful Trillium ID book that Jean Fret had put together. So they're a good resource as well. Mount Cuba Center, which is down in uh, Delaware. They're a great uh, resource for not only native plants, but Trillium specifically. So when I look at Trillium, I wanna look at how long is the stem, okay? Is the Trillium sitting upon the soil or is it up on a little bit of a stalk? So if it's up on a stalk, we call it an erect stem. If it's sitting up against the soil, we call it a de decumbent stem. And I actually believe the name of that trillium is decumbent trillium. So again, a nice name for that plant. I would say the highest percentage that you guys are all going to see are the ones that have a stalk, a stem to it. Um, the decumbent trillium are not that common. So the next thing we wanna look at is how do the flowers sit upon the leaf-like bracts? Um, I want to just call them leaves, but I, I'm pretty sure botanically they are called leaf, they are actually bracts, um, modified leaves. So on the left, you can see this trillium. Um, they have the, the, the petals are sitting right against that leaf-like bract. On the right-hand side, I have this bud and there's a little stalk that attaches that, that flower bud to the bracts. Okay, so if I am a trillium where my flowers sit right up, up on, that, on those bracts, it's called a sessile trillium. And the common name is often toad shade. The ones like this often have mottled leaves and which is supposed to resemble the skin of a toad or what I absolutely love to think about are this plant as a tiny toad umbrella. <laughs> I love when we get to, to talk about all these little plant nuances. That's where the common name comes from. That's why it's often handy and um, most useful to talk about plants with their scientific names because the common names sometimes get a little bit wacky. Um, the one on the, on the right here, the pedicillate trillium, so that little stalk that attaches the flower to the bracts, that's called the pedestal, um, pedicel. Sorry, I said that a little bit incorrectly. The pedicel is what attaches that flower to the leaf-like bract, so it's a pedicillate trillium. This group is often called wake robins, um, which means, you know, again, the derivation from its blooming 
around the time when the migrating robins would come back in spring. Now, I don't believe that the robins are migrating quite as much as they used to, um, but I think that's also kind of a cool reasoning for the common name. The other thing you wanna look at is how are the petals and sepals opening, right? So we looked at the stem, we looked at how the flower attaches, and now we'll look at the flower themselves. What about those petals? So here on the left, these petals are always gonna stay upright. They're never gonna spread open and we call those erect petals. The one in the center are really curved back, recurved, almost like trout lily. Um, and those we call recurved. The ones on the right here, that is called spreading petals. Um, a lot of the ones that have spreading petals, um, a, so, you know, maybe not a lot of them, some of them also have a wavy edge to them. Um, this kind of undulated edge to the petals, which is so cool. I know painted trillium also has those wavy edges. So let's look at a few specific trillium. Oh yes, before we do that, we get to talk about the doohickeys. So this is a trillium fruit. I had not seen a trillium fruit until I was on a tour at Mount Cuba Center. Um, this was back when Mount Cuba Center was not open to the public. You had to be there for a tour. I happened to be there in July for a hummingbird program and I was able to find this fruit. I was so excited. I had my like actual camera with me with my zoom lens and I went in and I zoomed up on this fruit and it was, I was way too close. And my zoom lens actually hit the fruit and it fell off the, st <laughs> off the stem. I was hoping no one was going to arrest me for, um, <laughs> for, for doing that to this poor plant. But what was so cool is I knew that this fruit was so ripe, it was ready to fall off. And I knew all these cool fun facts about spring ephemerals. So in the back, again, remember I'm a dissector, I'm a picker. So in the back, I could see it was rotted. You can see, you guys can all verify for me, vouch for me. Um, you can see how it's, how it's rotting and the flesh was starting to come off. So I just helped it a little bit. And in there were seeds with doohickeys. Again, these seeds with doohickeys, so exciting. And so I actually had to keep going with the tour and I was really hoping that if I left this, what I knew, would happen, would happen, and it did. The ants came marching. So again, there's these doohickeys on the seeds and ants want the doohickeys. So we have this wonderful partnership and propagation uh, where ants and spring ephemerals work together. So now I'm gonna tell you more of the scientific terms behind doohickey. Um, so there's a really cool term called myrmicocori. And that is the fancy scientific name for ant seed dispersal or ant farming, okay? So the doohickeys on those seeds, they're called eliosomes. And eliosomes are produced by spring ephemerals and they are attached to the seeds. There are these really cool fleshy bodies that are rich in lipids and proteins and the ants want to eat those. So they will come and they will take those seeds and they will bring them back to their colonies and they'll feed their larvae, they will eat them themselves. And what's really awesome about that is that is helping the seeds to move around, right? Not The plant wants to make more of itself, but the plant also would love to make more of itself and also spread out its populations. So these ants help by carrying them to their nest, putting them down in the nest, what are they doing? They're pretty much little ant farmers or little ant gardeners. So what's extra cool is that the plant itself within that eliosome has two different fatty acids that trigger behaviors in ants. One is called linoleic acid and the other is oleic acid. Linoleic acid stimulates feeding behavior in ants and oleic acid stimulates carrying behaviors in ants. So this super smart plant is creating these eliosomes with fatty acids that are attracting the ant to come eat and carry them. I mean, that, that to me is an amazing feat. So again, that little eliosome is eaten off of the seed and the seed is not touched. It's way too hard and big for them to eat. So they take that and they put it in their nest where um, you know, they might have, I think they're very well organized ants are, um, and they have like a, you know, a garbage pile, a recycling pile, I'm sure. Um, and they put their uh, you know, things in the trash pile and they are protecting that seed, you know, that seed did not just fall to the base of the plant. That seed got moved away and protected so it didn't get eaten by a little mouse or something else that might be coming through wanting to eat that seed. 
And some of the species that do this, that do um, produce eliosomes are spring beauties, trout lilies, Dutchman's breeches, bloodroot, twin leaf, trillium, and two plants that we aren't talking about tonight, uh, hepatica and violets. So again, I'm just amazed by this, this really cool relationship that has been produced. So I also it makes me look at ants a lot um, in a different light this time of year. So now we get to look at a couple trillium species. So this is yellow toad shade, trillium luteum. Um, trillium luteum, again, those petals are erect. They're never going to open up. Um, they have those wonderful mottled leaves, hence the name toad shade. Um, I have heard that it's the flowers might smell a little bit like almost lemony. So someone can let me know if they've ever smelled that. This is large flower trillium, trillium grandiflorum. Again, spreading petals. What's really neat about large flower trillium is that um, when it has been pollinated, the color of the petals will actually change. So it'll go from a white to a light, light, light pink to a little bit darker pink. So as the trillium, again, as it's pollinated and as it ages, the flower color will change um, to alert the pollinators, okay, I'm good, you have pollinated me, move on to something that you haven't visited, um, giving the other plants more of a chance to be pollinated. I think that's, again, these really cool adaptations that plants have. So you might walk by trillium once and see it's white and might walk by it a week later and it's pink. Um, no, your eyes aren't fooling you. Uh, that again is a uh, adaptation of the, of the plant as it has been pollinated. This is purple trillium or trillium erectum. Um, this one is a little different, right? We haven't seen this kind of um, um, maroon color, kind of carrion-esque color. I say that because some of the other common names for purple trillium are stinking Benjamin and wet dog trillium. Um, this trillium actually, one of its char um, characteristics and adaptations is to have a kind of a fetid smell, right? It puts off this little odor to attract things like beetles and flies to come visit. There's also Southern red trillium, which is trillium sulcatum. You can see just a little bit less of a spreading um, petal to it, a little bit more triangular. Same thing, kind of putting out that fetid smell. And then there's various nodding trilliums that are really interesting. Um, you know, some are a little bit more recurved or nod, um, big or small, lots of different options. So the last plant I'm gonna talk about kind of falls into a, a different category. I mean, really just a, more like spring, normal spring perennials, um, but they come up at the same time. So you might think, oh, these are everything that's up right now are all spring ephemerals. But, you know, our spring perennials, not that, I mean, spring ephemerals are also perennial plants, but these plants are going to persist longer um, into summer and they're gonna really form that wonderful woodland ground cover or interest in your garden as well. I'm gonna give you one example of mayapple. So mayapple, potophyllum peltatum, potophyllum meaning foot leaf, and peltatum meaning shield shape, which is all talking about that wonderful leaf. Um, let's look a little closer. So this time of year, this is what will happen. The leaf is all curled up upon itself and it pops out of that leaf litter. Um, I think it looks like a little umbrella closed up coming out and then that umbrella is popped open. Um, and it will grow nicely. You can see the trout lily in the back and in the front. It co-mingles nicely with our other spring ephemerals. But again, these leaves are going to last a whole lot longer than our spring ephemerals. And so mayapple will come up. And let's just back up one second. So um, this will, if it comes up and has one leaf, that's all it's going to do that year. It will not bloom. This is one that you need two leaves in order to bloom, which means that it just needs to store up more energy and get to the point, I went the wrong direction, um, where it can put up two leaves. So um, you'll see two leaves with a stalk, almost like the letter Y, with the flower bud in the center. And to me, this, they look like little cheerleaders with pom-poms. Um, this, again, two leaves with mayapple will produce a flower. And those leaves will continue to grow up and that flower will continue to kind of nod down. And it's just absolutely stunning. It creates almost like its own little shade canopy as well. 
And then if that flower has been visited by pollinators, it will produce a fruit. This is the May apple fruit. Um, definitely not in the apple family, but it does produce this apple. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fruit, maybe more like a rose hip looking um, fruit. But what I just want to put a little caution out there, you know, people say May apples are edible. Well, a May apple fruit is edible at a certain time of year um, when it's perfectly, perfectly ripe. Now I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious of a person, not so much a risk taker. Um, I like to dissect things, but maybe I'm not a risk taker. Um, I've never eaten a May apple before. I know people make jams and jellies and stuff out of that, but you have to know exactly when it's, when it's ripe. Otherwise this plant is actually extremely toxic. Um, it was used as a form of suicide for Native Americans. So, but actually in smaller doses, it's very medicinal. Um, they make cancer uh, drugs from this plant as well. So not one to really mess with in my eyes. Um, not exactly worth, worth getting it wrong, right? Um, but what's really cool is who eats it is box turtles. And they have actually done research on this. And when the fruit goes through the digestive tract of a box turtle and comes out on the other end, it has a higher germination rate than if it had just been, you know, fruit fallen and just, you know, germinated right underneath the parent plant. So um, again, I think that's really cool that we're doing research and finding out that something's happening in the digestive tract of a box turtle, probably some kind of acidification, um, scarification in there. And then when it comes out in that nice little um, fertilizer package, you know, it's just kind of set up for success. So um, I think there's, it's really cool to think about all the different scientific research, research that's being done on all of these plants. All right, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, so thank you again for joining in tonight and learning a little bit more about spring ephemerals. Um, as I mentioned, Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens is a fabulous place to come and look at native plants, especially our spring ephemerals, which are definitely popping up and starting to bloom. We're kind of pushing right into uh, prime season for that. And I think the warmer weather over the next week or so is going to help even push those along further. Cool things to know about Jenkins is that we are open daily. And we are always free of an admission fee. So we would love it if you would come and visit. Again, it's located in Devon. Um, so all of you who are joining us who are local, we would love to have you come this, this spring. Uh, we also have a wonderful collection of rhododendrons and azaleas. Um, so if you are able to visit during the weekday, we always suggest that weekends in the spring when it's beautiful, uh, gets pretty busy here and we have a small parking lot, but um, again, would love to have you visit and I'm happy to take some questions. So I will stop sharing at this point. We'll see what you guys have. Well, thank you, Amy. That was um, amazing. So some great photography, some great um, insights, some great little tidbits, both scientific and anecdotal. <laughs> um, so we do have um, a number of questions. Uh, okay. So let's start with um, one that came in with the registration. Um, which ephemerals are likely to self-seed or reseed? Sure. So with that question, um, we just need to think about the plant itself. So spring ephemerals are perennials. So they are not, even though we call them ephemeral, it's not an annual, right? So they go through their life cycle really quickly, but they are a perennial plant, which means as a plant, they will come back year after year, just as a plant itself, right? As it's established in your garden. Um, as far as seeds, you know, hopefully it's visited by a pollinator and it creates seeds. And that, you know, means that you get more of that plant in your garden. Um, but the way I'm interpreting that question is um, thinking of it as an annual, but it's actually a perennial plant, which is more bang for your buck, right? So. So, um probably um, kind of leads directly into this just kind of for further clarification. Um, and so this question was, can all ephemerals be classified as perennials? Yes, I do believe that all of the spring ephemerals are perennial plants. They just have a very short lifespan. Um, but if you get that plant in the ground, it's going to act like the other native perennials that you'll have or other perennials in your garden, that they will come back for you. They're just only around for a shorter period of time. 
So next question, um, when is a good time to plant ephemerals? Sure. So, you know, we are selling some um, some ephemerals right now at Jenkins. So I think this is an this is an okay time to get them in the ground. The tricky part about spring ephemerals. So now that you know about their life cycle, they're going to go dormant for the rest of the year. So if we were to sell them, say in fall, which is also a great time to get things in the ground, right? We would be selling you a pod of soil with no plant showing, right? Um, you would um, hopefully trust us as a reputable source that yes, there was a plant here. It's just now died back, um, but that's a hard sell, right? Like come buy pots of soil with hopefully a plant in it. So most of the spring ephemerals that you'll find out in, you know, at, at public gardens or at garden shops, um, they will be selling them this time of year because they have something to show, right? Um, so, you know, it might be different for like more of these online vendors, these, um, you know, native plant vendors. I know like Moo Moon, um, that might do something more like an online shipping might, they might have different timing, but in my eyes, you're going to buy it in spring because that's when it's, it's um, up and you'll notice it in the pot. So. So one of the um, plants that you talked a little bit about was bloodroot. And we had a question, um, what's the best location to plant that? Sure. So we can kind of categorize all the spring ephemerals in, um, which is kind of nice. A lot of them have similar cultural conditions that they need. So they're going to want to be planted in a spot that is, um, you know, like a woodland scenario. So they're going to want the ability to get the light this time of year, but then they're going to want to be shaded out for the rest of the time that they're underground. Um, so to me, that's like a part shade, shade condition. So you're thinking more of like a woodland garden setting. The other thing that they're going to really want is a moist soil. But you have to find a balance. I have a ton of clay at home. I wouldn't be able to, I don't think I would do well with most spring ephemerals. Now, bluebells, Mertensia virginica, can handle a little bit more wet um, than some of these, but they're going to want a moist soil, but also a soil that drains. Because the concept, again, of spring ephemerals is that they have underground storage structures. It's kind of the same if you think about like, again, crocuses, daffodils. If you throw that thing in super wet, it's going to get mushy, it's going to rot, that underground structure is going to rot out. So you want moist, but you don't want super wet spot. Again, bluebells can tolerate a little bit more. So what I would say is like, again, kind of a moist soil scenario, a shady garden is perfect, um, a spot where it's going to get sun this time of year and then um, be shaded for the rest of the time. So our next question, what is the longest living spring ephemeral? Ooh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I don't know if I know exactly what their intent of the question was, but I will, um, if you mean like, longest living plant? I don't know if I know exactly. I mean, if you're thinking about some of these trilliums that take, goodness, four, seven, 11 years to get to the point where they're blooming, um, and then they're going to be around for hopefully, a, you know, subsequent years after that. I mean, that's a pretty long-lived perennial. Um, if you're talking about during a season, which one will you keep above ground the longest? Um, I would say I noticed bloodroot leaves pushing into summer last year at Jenkins um, in a spot that I wouldn't, you know, it caught my eye and I was like, wait, bloodroot, you're still around. Um, so the leaves were still up. Um, I would say things like trout lily die back pretty quick. Um, the dicentras, the let me just say pantaloons one more time tonight. Um, the Dutchman's breeches, you know, those kind of tend to, to kind of die back in your garden. Um, spring beauties, definitely. I mean, they're so small anyways. They're, if you have other plants growing, they'll kind of take over. So, you know, I would kind of think about planting them in your garden like you, a little bit like you treat or should treat your, your bulbs and other things, right? So like um, daffodils and crocuses in your garden, 
you know, you don't want to cut back the foliage. You want to let it die back by itself. And so a lot of times you want to kind of um, plant other things that are going to grow up and kind of mask it when those plants kind of die back. Because if you have a spot in a garden, you only plant spring ephemerals, um, it's going to look really barren at a certain time in the year for the rest of the year. So um, we kind of call it companion planting, right? When you plant other things that are going to grow taller and as those are dying back, then you won't have those holes in your garden. Um, so we've got um, another question, uh, actually two, turns out two related questions. Uh, so one, are any of these eaten or propagated by animals such as groundhogs? And then someone also asked whether deer eat any ephemerals. Ah. Uh. Yes, deer. I should have been more on my deer game tonight. I don't know if I'm, I'm totally there for you. I have heard that someone told me once that her bluebells were not eaten as much by deer or if, you know, they, they were not the favorites within her group. They were leaving, her deer were leaving the bluebells alone. So I'll share that anecdote. Um, trillium, I mean, you know, deer, they'll come up and they'll just eat they'll just eat the flower right off and they'll just walk away. And you're like, come on. Um, may apple, which is not technically a spring ephemeral, but I put it in at the end. Um, may apple with all those toxins. I have to believe that deer are leaving that one alone because that's not a smart thing to eat. Um, the rest of them, I do believe they get snacked on. Um, but I might have to go back and check check my notes on that one. Um, remind you, second, is that if they're propagated by animals, is that what you had said? Yeah, eaten, propagated. Yeah, I mean, I think if they're producing, if they're producing seed pods, I'm sure that other things are eating them. Um, like I mentioned with the trillium, when, you know, those seed pods are popping open and um, out there, I'm sure, you know, things like mice and other things are, are snacking on, on those um, seeds. And then the box turtles, of course, are eating um, may apples. There's other things that eat may apple fruits as well. Um, so I don't know if they're, I don't think that's like a, a relationship that we really talk about with spring ephemerals, like plant this because it's a wildlife plant. Um, it's more like it's an awesome native plant which supports, okay, let's think of it this way. Let's not think about wildlife eating them, let's think of wildlife from a pollen and nectar perspective. These plants in your garden are gonna be like the first sources of nectar for those queen bumblebees. Our native bees need these native plants. So let's think of it more that way. Yes, it is wildlife connected that we're growing them for pollinators, but not maybe necessarily for like consumption of the, the fruit and the seeds. But that's, that's a valid question. I can you know, even for my, sorry, it's not with you guys, but my next presentation, I can look up and see if there's more um, animals that would eat the, eat the seeds and the fruits. All right, I think we'll, um, you know, keeping an interest on time and respecting people's time. We'll do one more question and that's, um, does Jenkins have an herbarium? Ooh, an herbarium. Not to my knowledge. I am at Jenkins right now. We have a ton of books. I'm in um, our area that has um, kind of functions as a library as well as a, a workshop space. But um, no, I have never seen herbarium sheets or herbarium specimens here. Um, that's, a, that's a cool thought. We're not quite as old of a, of a property. Um, as some of the other organizations too, um, we were just, we were, we were founded as a public garden in the 70s. Um, so while of course the, the land was always around, I, I don't know that we necessarily have had a lot of scientific research that has been happening um, to the point of having herbarium specimens, but um, yeah, that would be my answer there. All right, well, um, thank you so much, Amy. Um, really so informative. Um, so I wanna, Kind of wrap up, uh, let you know about next month's presentation. Let me go ahead and share my screen.
So you can see um, next month's presentation is um, going to be provided by um, Dr. Laura Gurton, who's one of the um, organizers or the primary organizer of uh, this lecture series. So um, Dr. Gurdon isn't here tonight as um, return visitors will have noticed. And that's because she is currently on the ship that's pictured here. Um, so which is where she will be next month. And she's gonna be giving a tour of that particular ship and the research that's being done um, on that ship. Uh, so you can go to the DCIS um, lecture series website. Um, I'm gonna post that link in the chat um, and encourage you to register for that. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. You know, post that um, link to the chat. So I encourage you to go and register for that. It should be a really fascinating uh, presentation next month. Um, at this point, I will turn it back over to Jeremiah. Yeah, my mic uh, may not be working as well as it was in the beginning. So thank you, everybody, for coming. The next lecture will be occurring in the day. One and it will be recorded as well. So just thanks a lot, Amy. Thank you. Everyone have a great evening.